Hey, Senator Cassettes, we want to start off our, our conversation here about China from a um, national security military perspective here. So we're going to go to James Carafano from Heritage Foundation. Uh, he has a new book out called Surviving the End and also Wiki at War, Conflict in a Socially Networked World. Mr. Carafano, how are you, sir? Good, yes. How are Glad you're here. <laughs> Let's, um, Can we just before we talk about... Again? I'm sorry. I'm just not doing good. All right, good. So can you do it again? Sorry. Oh, good. I'm serious yeah. now. All right. <laughs> Three, two, one. Oh. Hey, hey, Senator Crusaders, I want to uh, start off our conversation about China talking from a national security military perspective. We're going to do that with James Carafano from the Heritage Foundation, author of Surviving the End and Wiki at War, Conflict in a Socially Networked World. Mr. Carafano, how are you, sir? Good, good to be with you. Glad you're here. So let's, uh, before we get to the military, uh, let's talk corona, coronavirus, and, and your take on China's initial response to it and, and why things like this keep coming out of China. Right. Well, first of all, it's completely irresponsible. Um, matter of fact, the National Security Advisor was just at the Heritage Foundation yesterday, and he pointed out that the, the Chinese really cost us two critical weeks. In other words, by the time they mm -hmm. acknowledged to the world that the disease was spreading and they provided the kind of information that would ena enable people to test and track it, Essentially, the cow was already out of the barn. A lot of people have left after the Chinese New Year and gone back to places like Europe and other places, and they and they really started the global pandemic. So they are really kind of criminals, one. And kind of two and three are countries like Iran and Italy because they did not restrict travel from China even after they knew the disease was beginning to spread, and they imported uh, uh, mass. So now we're going to have a big problem in the Middle East because of Iran. And uh, there's a, a large number of uh, migrant Chinese workers in Italy, in northern Italy. We've got a big outbreak mm -hmm. there. That, that means it's guaranteed to spread throughout the Schengen community. That's why we have the travel ban. Essentially, Europe uh, and Iran are the new China, the new sources of exporting the disease. Uh, uh, so fair to say that Trump's initial travel ban from China was uh, the right call? It was, and what it did is, is it bought us some time. And uh, I know people are frustrated about the proliferation of testing and everything, but actually what's much more important is the later the disease got here in the flu season, the, the shorter time Americans really will have to deal with it. So we've basically had a critical 30 days to get through. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think all the measures that communities and people are taking down social distancing from the NFL, I mean, not the NFL, but the National Hockey okay. League, that, all that's good stuff. And, and hopefully if people take that seriously, if people who are not feeling well stay at home, that's going to be the most effective thing getting us through the next 30 days and really preventing a large outbreak here. Let's, uh, let's move to China in general. So would you say, well, who is our biggest geopolitical threat? And, and maybe how would you define threat, I guess, even in that question? Yeah, so I think it's really countries that destabilize the, the global order that we have, the ability of the United States to operate globally and protect its interests uh, and uh, meet its responsibilities. And when people say, what's the greatest threat? It's like the guy that goes to the doctor and said, uh, the doctor says you have cancer, uh, heart disease, and a brain tumor. Which one do you want me to cure? And you're like, well, doc, I want to live, so deal all three. We're a global power. We need to operate globally, so we have to be concerned about Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, we, we might treat them all differently, but, but we have to be serious about Western Europe, about the Middle East, about the Indo-Pacific. So China is clearly the greatest long-term destabilizing challenge, but it doesn't mean we can ignore the other ones. What, very well said. What's China's vision for the world? Um, China wants essentially to globally dominate all the resources, people, and tools it needs to be a self-sustaining superpower forever. And so that literally is a band of hard Chinese influence that stretches from uh, the South China Seas all the way through Central Europe. Okay. And, and uh, includes Af places yeah. like Africa and, uh, uh, and, uh, and large swaths of the Middle East. So I'm just trying to visualize that properly. So let's go, let's do, let's talk about Africa. Cause I've heard about that a couple of years ago about their major investments in Africa. Uh, what kind of investments, what kind of involvement and why? What's their play there? Well, I think um, three things. One is resources. They want to lock in all the resources and all the 
the travel route that those resources would follow. So essentially, mm. they are self-sustaining forever. So cheap resources, Africa's a great source of that. Uh, the second one is low-wage manufacturing. Eventually, China recognizes that its economy will grow and they can't produce things the most cheaply. What they want to wow. do is have factories in other places where they can get a piece of that action. So they want to ha control the low-wage manufacturing that will eventually develop in Africa. And third is customers. They want to force other people to buy their stuff. So you, those three things are why Africa has been always been a prime target for uh, China. Wow, that's really interesting. How, and this is a big question because Africa is a big place, but how are the people of Africa uh, embracing Chinese involvement? Well, they've had a lot of penetration because one, people haven't really kind of paid attention to it, and two, because the, the Chinese have bribed and, and cheated their way into all kinds of places. So for example, they built the building for the African Union, and the African Union is like, oh, thank you very much, that's great. Wow. Um, what they didn't tell you is they, they basically riddled it with spyware so they know everything that's going on. Uh, you know, enormous debt, uh, that's another, you know, uh, another way to get, you buy up resources, you default on the debt, they take the assets. And of course, bribery. I mean, you have very weak governance in a lot of these places. So the Chinese make 10 people rich and nobody really bothers that that impoverishes, you know, tens of millions. Supply chain is a big thing that's been talked about lately because right. of coronavirus and the disruption to it. Um, what you mentioned trading routes like and I, I mean, what's the name of that it's like the silk road plan or something like that right so right, it's like very right. old school trading silk routes that have been around for thousands of years why yeah right. why are they still relevant today and or how are they still relevant today and why does china want to control them what do they get with that well the the most important ones are the ones that go by sea still 90 percent of the world's goods are transported by by sea and if you control them yeah. that's part of ensuring that you control everything so for example the south china seas through the straits of malacca most of the most of the oil and natural gas that Asia consumes come from Russia in the middle. They pass through that area, and so controlling that's uh, super important. So, so that's, I want to segue into the South China Sea conversation. So what's that whole thing about? Well, one, it's about strategically controlling the, the important waterways that are really the lifeline of Asia. Uh, and two, it's really about pushing the United States out of the Indo-Pacific. If you hear this term, first island chain, second island chain, if you look at all the, the little tiny dots, nations and islands in the second island chain, and you do a map of the Japanese offensive in World War II, where the goal was, let's control enough of the geography, essentially to prevent the United States from coming into the Indo-Pacific. Those are all the places that China is trying to get in today, from Papua New Guinea to, to the Marshall Islands to small little islands in the Pacific. Are they doing it the same way they did Africa? They're doing Africa. Uh, yeah, it, well, a little different in the sense in the South China Sea, what they're actually doing is militarily occupying these places to limit the capacity of uh, the U.S. to get in. So there's actually two military things when we when we talk about when we don't. But what we talk about is is pushing out the ability of the United States to project power. The other is, is China's submarines uh, are diesel, which means they don't travel across the world like our nuclear submarines do. Um, and, and they're still relatively noisy. That is their number one nuclear platform. If they control the South China Seas and we can't essentially monitor that waterway, then they can very quickly deploy their submarines into the South China Seas and they have a very resilient, effective uh, nuclear force. So it's also about the nuclear balance of power, not talked about as much. Oh, sorry, I, excuse my news. Explain that. What's the significance of the diesel-powered subs versus so our diesel, nuclear ones? Diesel subs don't have the range that nuclear subs do, right? So if there are two ways to kind of hide your nuclear powered your nuclear weapons underwater, one way is like what we do is you have nuclear powered wow. submarines and go out into the middle of the ocean and, and stay there forever and you can't find them. Uh, diesel submarines can't do that. They don't have that range. So what, what you wanna do with a diesel submarine is you wanna have waters that the other guys can't get in and look at you. So if you can control the South China Seas, you don't have to get out into the middle of the ocean to hide. You can hide in the South China Seas. That makes your, your, your uh, 
your ballistic missile force on submarines way more survivable. Very interesting. Okay, last question for you. I know we got to go. Um, wh what do, rank like how, like, who's ahead? And I know there's a huge question, right? But like, who's ahead in these battles overall? Are we ahead? Are they ahead? And what do we do to make sure that we win? Yeah. <laughs> So the short answer is it doesn't matter. I mean, the Chinese want to win without fighting. In other words, they don't want to fight World War III with us, and we don't want to fight World War III with them. What's key in the military competition is that nobody, that the Chinese never think that, well, if I have to fight, you know, I can win. So that's the number one thing is, is convince the Chinese that they can never win by fighting. If they want to try to win without fighting, we can compete with them at all day long. So. What the president's been doing and building up the U.S. military the last three years, super, super important for this. It's really resetting the table with the Chinese. Great stuff. James Carafano, Harris Foundation, awesome introduction. Uh, let's talk again. We'll go into more detail with all that one day. Thanks. Thanks, James. Appreciate you.